Okay, we carry on. Uh, in chapter 10, Gospel of Mark chapter 10, in the very opening in the first 12 verses there, Jesus leaves Capernaum and he goes to the region of Judea and beyond. So he's leaving Galilee, he goes down to Judea, he goes down to the region beyond the Jordan. And even here there are crowds that gather and Jesus teaches them. And in response to a question by the Pharisees where they're trying to to pin him to something and work against him. But in, in response to a question that they put to him about divorce, Jesus teaches that it's God's will for kingdom participants to stay married. And as I said when we ended last week, we have to labor to offer our marriages to the Lord. And we have to stop rationalizing and tolerating our sin in this area. Our entire lives belong to Christ. He owns all of our lives, including our marriages. And we need to take that seriously. Now let's pick back up with chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, where uh, some people, they're bringing children to Jesus to touch them, meaning to bless them in association with touching them. That's what that's about. And in Luke chapter 18, verse 15, he specifies that they were babies, And the disciples apparently hadn't learned their lesson from Jesus' teaching in Mark 9, 36 and 37 when they had brought the small child to him and they rebuke the people who are bringing the babies to Jesus for him to bless them through touching. And Jesus is indignant. And it's not good to have the Lord indignant about something you're doing, but he's indignant and tells them not to hinder the children from coming to him. He says, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It belongs to such as these. That is, little children, they serve as analogs of disciples. The kingdom belongs to such as these. They serve as analogs of disciples in that their acceptance of their lack of entitlement to anything and their dependence on others, that reflects the kind of attitude that's necessary to become a disciple. So they're analogs in that this idea of recognizing and accepting their lack of status, their complete dependence, that's the kind of attitude that's necessary to become a disciple. And their lack of social status or rank that I've talked about in the last couple of weeks reflects the same lack of status or rank in those who have become disciples. So they're analogs in a couple of ways. In this dependence and in this lack of status. Now one who comes, one comes to Jesus, who comes to him, has to understand and accept that, that he or she has no claim on his grace. Right? We come with no sense of entitlement to Jesus. You can't come to Jesus bargaining. You can't come to Jesus saying, listen, uh, here's how we'll do it. Uh, I'm going to keep this, and you can have that. And I'm going to do this and that. Because you're fortunate to have me. It's not like that at all. One comes to the Lord in absolute dependence and surrender. It is visually this. That's how one comes to the Lord, you see. And so that's what you're, you see that in the children with their acceptance of that state and their dependence. And that's how we have to come to the Lord. And one who will not receive the kingdom, one who will not receive the kingdom that Jesus presently offers, will not enter the consummated kingdom of the future at Christ's return. And one who receives the kingdom, who becomes a disciple, walks a road of social rejection. That's we've talked about that. Take up your cross and follow me. Taking up your cross is to walk the road of the convicted. It is to walk the road of the social outcast. And that is what it was to become a Christian in the first century. It wasn't some grand, you know, uh, some way for upward mobility in the society. It was to embrace a path of social rejection, humiliation, and hostility. 
And that's what happens here. So one who becomes a disciple walks the road of rejection that parallels the child's lack of status in the first century world. And so I think he, he, they're bringing them to them. These, these people are rebuking them. And Jesus is indignant about that. And then he uses them as analogs of a disciple. And he then illustrates the blessing in store for those who will imitate the lowly station of a child through their embrace of Jesus. They will imitate that lowly station. And he shows, illustrates the blessing in store of them by taking the child in his arms and blessing him. That's the message that you're seeing here. And we often do this so one dimensionally. We look and say, well, he's blessing the children. He's blessing the children as analogs of disciples. You see, showing that those who will embrace that, that childlike dependence that is necessary to become a disciple, the idea that I have no status or entitlement, and then who will also share in their lack of status having become a disciple, what is in store for them? The blessings of God. The blessings of God are in store for, for such as these. See, the blessings of the kingdom, they don't, they don't follow the wisdom of the world. Who gets blessed in the kingdom? The lowly. See, those who are willing to embrace the Lord and to walk the road of low rank and status, who are to take the role of a servant well, what do they get? In the world, what do they get? They get used. They get abused. In the kingdom perspective, what do they get? The blessings of God. They get the blessings of God. You see, the lowly will be exalted. And then Jesus, in, in 17 to 31, he dialogues with the rich man about the danger of riches. As he, as he was setting out for another place, a man approaches him. Man falls on his knees and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wants to know how he can ensure a place in God's eternal kingdom at the consummation. This is what this guy wants to know. He's asking what's necessary for salvation. And Mark indicates in verse 22 that the man's very wealthy. But he says nothing about the man's age. Nor does he say anything about the man's political position. Of course, Matthew indicates that he's young. Luke indicates that he's some kind of ruler. But Mark simply says that he's very wealthy. Now, Jesus asks him, he says, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. And what I think he's saying is, look, given that you don't recognize that I'm God. Given that you don't recognize or realize that, your calling me good shows that you mistakenly believe that a mere man can be truly good. You see, you're, you're not realizing or not accepting or recognizing that I'm God and coming up calling me good. That suggests that you think that a mere man can be good. And the truth is that only God is absolutely good. Now, Jesus, of course, is God. And he is absolutely good. But he's answering this person from his perspective. He says, why do you call me good? Given your perspective. Given this idea that, you know, that you don't recognize that. Why are you calling me good? And he then tells the man, he, he, so he says, why do you call me good? The truth is that God's only God is absolutely good. And then he tells the man, you know the commandments. This guy wants to know, what do I have to do to be saved? I want to be there in the end. I want to share in that perfect reality, that eternal, glorious, wonderful state of absolute fulfillment. I want to be there. And so Jesus, he says, he tells the man, you know the commandments. And he cites from the Ten Commandments those, those associated with a person's relationship with others. Those that give concrete expression to love for others. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Now Jesus isn't advocating 
a works righteousness. He's not doing that. He's saying that salvation requires heartfelt allegiance to God. That's that's it. Salvation requires heartfelt allegiance to God. An inner surrender to him as God, which inevitably will manifest in obedience to God's will, a will that includes loving other people. You see, as Jesus will say, we'll see in Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 31, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, they are linked as the two greatest commandments. Because to love God that way, necessarily you will then love your neighbors as God wants you to love them. You can't have that love for God and then treat how God wants you to be as something that's optional. So when you truly give your heart and allegiance to God, that inevitably and necessarily manifests in your life. And so he wants to know, and so Jesus is letting him know, look, this is what it's about. It's about this ultimate heartfelt allegiance to God that expresses itself in this world in love of other people. Now the man declares that he's kept all these commandments since his youth. But motivated by his love for this person. You see, that's what's happening. Jesus is motivated by his love for this person. Jesus puts his finger on the one thing the man lacked. The one thing the man lacked. Undivided loyalty to God. That's what he lacked. Now that's fundamental. But that is the one thing that the man lacked. He had allowed his wealth to become an idol. Something that he valued more than a relationship with God. And to reveal that truth to the man. Jesus tells him to go and sell what he has. Give to the poor. And then follow Jesus. In other words, he calls him to choose because he loves him. He calls him to choose between his wealth and God, between retaining his wealth or giving it to the poor and following Jesus. And he does that to expose the state of his heart. He's trying to, you know, he's searching for this epiphany for this man. He wants this man to realize That I really do worship money. I really do care more about my wealth than I do about my relationship with God. Because that's the first step in changing that. You have to have your eyes opened and see that's who you really are. Because you will persuade yourself, no, that's not who I am. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't, you know, I've not made an idol out of money. So Jesus exposes that. And he's doing it to bless the person. And the man was disheartened by this word. And he went away sad, meaning he went away without salvation because he had great wealth. You see, when push came to shove, when push came to shove, he loved his money more than he loved God. And he was sad that God demanded of him More than he was willing to give. So he comes hoping to get some kind of thing. What do I have to do? You know, I've been this good guy. And Jesus just focuses right in and says, the one thing you lack is an undivided loyalty to God. Watch. Sell what you have and come follow me. No. Okay. All right. That's how it is. You see, we look at this guy and say, you know, it's it's easy to think that this is somebody here and disassociate from him. But you have to wonder, you see, uh, how are we and what will we do in that situation? Now, Jesus uses that encounter to instruct his disciples. You see, right down here, he says how difficult it will be for those who have wealth 
to enter the kingdom of God. Now listen to that. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, saying how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. That's like, you know, warning Will Robinson. You know, from the old show. That's like, you know, okay, pay attention because this is serious. This is something serious. Jesus tells them that. And this amazes the disciples. Now, it probably amazes the disciples because of the common Jewish perspective that riches were a sign of divine favor and blessing. That was a fairly common understanding. Proverbs 10.22 says the blessing of the Lord brings wealth. And you have many people who have ridden this one thread and turned it into an industry. Just turn on television. These health and wealth people, they're talking to you like, listen, Christianity is an investment. You want to really grow your portfolio. What you need to do is throw some you know, props to God. And what will happen is he'll throw some money in your account. That's about it. That, that's what they're saying. They may dress it up in some other God talk, but that's it. And of course, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. But here you see, so they have this idea. And with some, you know, with some basis, you can see that, yes, wealth can be something God provides. It is a blessing from God. You see, and so this idea has developed when you think of who's, who's the first guy to be saved. It's going to be the guy who's got wealth because he's already sharing in God's blessing. But the Old Testament, it also warns of the dangers of riches. You know, it's not a one-note song. And part of doing theology, you see, is trying to integrate everything. You can't just hop on one thread and then say, okay, that's it. No. You see, there are a lot of things that have to be thought through and integrated. Or you create a, a twisted picture and you mislead people. But so there is this thread here about the warnings of riches. And that's the theme that Jesus is emphasizing. And he repeats that it's difficult. In verse 24, he repeats that it's difficult to enter the kingdom of God. And the reference to the rich is, is implied. So again, it's difficult for the rich, those who have wealth... To enter the kingdom of God. And he emphasizes the difficulty of the rich entering the kingdom of heaven. With this hyperbolic. Exaggeration for effect. This hyperbolic proverbial statement. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now literally of course it's impossible. For a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But I think Jesus is overstating the difficulty. He's painting it as impossible to emphasize how hard it is. You see, it's like we might say to somebody. It's easier to fly to the moon by flapping your arms than to become CEO of Microsoft. Okay, we don't mean, see, we don't, we're not saying, it's just a colorful way of stressing the low probability. It's not a declaration of actual impossibility. We're simply emphasizing that it's real difficult. And I don't want us to miss that. It's real difficult. It's real difficult. The disciples are stunned. When they hear this, they're stunned and they say, well, then who can be saved? If it's so difficult for these rich people to be saved, well, then how in the world is anybody else going to be saved? You see, how, how in the world are they going to be saved? If it's hard for those who are thought to have God's favor, to have God's blessing because they have wealth. Those who, because of their wealth, are in a position to help the poor. Those who, because of their wealth, have leisure time to devote to religious study. If they can't be saved, well, then how can the rest of mankind be saved? And in response, 
Jesus shifts from stressing the hindrance that wealth poses to salvation to focusing on the absolute impossibility of salvation for anyone apart from the working of God. The absolute impossibility of salvation for anyone apart from the working of God. Only God can awaken the sin-corrupted fallen man. Rich or poor, only God can awaken fallen man to make responding to him possible. He opens our eyes and he brings us to our senses that we then are able to choose whether to embrace him. You see, without his drawing us, we would be helpless, hopeless, prisoners in utter darkness. Now, I'm afraid we don't often appreciate how dire the situation was from which God rescued us. We tend to think, look, no, 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 I was rightly under condemnation for my sins, but sin hadn't corrupted my insight and judgment, hadn't corrupted my desire and will, hadn't corrupted my moral disposition. No, 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 I was just fine. I'd simply committed a crime and the penalty was eternal punishment. But I wasn't corrupted so that I couldn't see. And I think that's misunderstanding the depth of what God has done for us. You see, I think the truth is more like the illustration that's given by Jerry Walls and Joseph Dongle in their book, Why I Am Not a Calvinist. I emphasize the not because sometimes when I read this, people think it sounds Calvinistic, but it's not. Why I'm not a Calvinist. It is simply an understood idea about the depth of sin's demolition of mankind. What has sin done to us? How bad was the situation from which God rescued us? And in contrast to seeing the lost sinner see merely as a, a convicted criminal who at the front gate of a prison is offered, offered a pardon from this inescapable eternal punishment... They see the sinner as already imprisoned in the deepest corner of a terrorist camp. And they write, bound, gagged, blindfolded, and drugged. The prisoner is weak and delusional. The prisoner can't even begin to plead for help or plan an escape. In fact, the prisoner feels at home in the dank squalor of the cell. She has come to identify with her captors and will try to fight off any attempted rescue. Only a divine invasion will succeed. God steals into the prison and makes it to the bedside of the victim. God injects a serum that begins to clear the prisoner's mind of delusions and quell her hostile reactions. God removes the gag from the prisoner's mouth and shines a flashlight around the pitch black room. The prisoner remains mute as the rescuer's voice whispers, Do you know where you are? Let me tell you. Do you know who you are? Let me show you. And as the wooing begins, divine truth begins to dawn on the prisoner's heart and mind. The Savior holds up a small mirror to show the prisoner her sunken eyes and frail body. Do you see what they've done to you? And do you see how you've given yourself to them? Even in the dim light, the prisoner's weakened eyes are beginning to focus. The rescuer continues. Do you know who I am and that I want you for myself? Perhaps the prisoner makes no obvious advance but does not turn away. The Savior presses on. I know that part of you suspects that I've come to harm you, but let me show you something. My hands, they're a bit bloody. I crawled through an awful tangle of barbed wire to get to you. Now here in this newly created sacred space, in this moment of new possibility, the Savior whispers, I want to carry you out of here right now. 
give me your heart. Trust me. You see, and I think we so often overlook the work of God's grace and mercy in our lives in bringing us to a position that we are able to choose. You see, now he doesn't determine the choice. That would be Calvinistic. But he brings us in his grace to a place where we can choose. And he wants us, of course, to choose to follow him. That's his goal. That's why he died. Now, Peter says to Jesus that he and his fellow apostles, in contrast to the rich man, he says that they've left everything to follow him. And since Peter still had a home and he still had a fishing boat, it seems that leaving everything need not mean actually divesting of everything as Jesus had called the rich man to do. He called the rich man to actually divest of everything he had and to come follow him. Now, why did he do that? He did that because he was trying to, in love, expose the one thing the man lacked. What was it? Undivided loyalty. He had fooled himself into thinking, no, 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 I'm all down. I'm all in. God's the main thing. I live for God. That was a lie. He had deluded himself, as we are excellent at doing. And so he called that person to that. But so here, it it need not always mean actually divesting oneself of everything. It can mean being willing to walk away from things, to deny them a hold on one's life that prevents or hinders one's service to Christ. It's about keeping things in proper perspective. And Jesus says that those like the apostles who will put him first, see, which in their situation, putting him first, it meant leaving their home and joining him in traveling to proclaim the gospel. That is what he had called them to do. That is what in their situation and context it meant to put Jesus first. He says that those who will do that will in the present age they will receive a hundred, it will receive a hundredfold the family and provisions they left behind. And in the age to come, they will receive eternal life. Well, they receive family and provisions in the present age through the brothers and sisters in the faith. Right? Through a new family. Through a new family that provides for one another's needs. You see, I'm here and I'm taking this thing that's going to alienate me and leave me and I'm leaving family. He says, but you're entering into a new family. You are entering into a new family that is a hundredfold the family that you left. And you're entering into provision that is a hundredfold what you left. Because as a family, we care for one another. That's what families do. So he tells them that. And then when he, so in in the present age, that's how you this hundredfold, that's what that means. And when Jesus returns to consummate the kingdom, they will then enter into eternal resurrection life. So that's this thing about in the age to come, in, in, in the present age, in the age to come. And then Jesus adds regarding the eschaton, this final state, He adds regarding that, that many who are first will be last, and the last first. Now, taking my my cue from the parable of the workers in the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, which follows the parallel to this section in Matthew 19. So it's not crazy to take my cue from that. Taking my cue from that, that parable, I think the point is that the disciples... Christians will be blessed with glorious, eternal resurrection life at the eschaton. But the giving of special honors or privileges in that state, for instance, whether to sit at their Lord's right or left, the giving of those privileges and special honors often will not comport with human notions of entitlement. Human notions of entitlement are the first is first and the last is last. 
But the way this is going to happen is that the, the, the first is going to be last and the last will be first. You see, all labor will be rewarded. But God is free, meaning he's not unjust. God is free to give as he chooses the same or more to one who didn't labor as long or under as difficult conditions. God blesses based on his generosity, not on human notions of entitlement, not on the first being first and the last being last. So the door in terms of these special honors or privileges is wide open for surprises, reversals of expectation for which God cannot rightly be criticized. You cannot say that God is unjust for granting an award in the eschaton, a position of privilege here to someone who didn't labor as much as Paul because he gives on the basis of his generosity. So it's not subject to criticism that he's somehow being unjust. Okay, so that's what I draw from that parable and I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. And then in 1032 to 34, Mark here explicitly identifies Jerusalem as Jesus' goal. And it seems that there are two groups that are identified here. There's the 12 and those who follow. Now, the latter presumably are other followers of Jesus and perhaps pilgrims heading to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. So Jesus is bound for Jerusalem. There's the 12 and there are uh, uh, those who followed who are also there. And the 12, it says, are amazed. This is just kind of interesting. They're amazed. At what? You see? Well, what are they amazed at? Well, perhaps they're amazed at Jesus' resoluteness in heading as the Messiah into Jerusalem. You see, given their concept of the Messiah's work, this would be the beginning of war and great upheaval. And so, given that perception, here is Jesus just resolutely heading to Jerusalem from their thinking, knowing that what this is going to trigger, this is going to trigger just this war, this tremendous upheaval, but look at him. He's just, perhaps that's what they're amazed at. And that would be consistent with the idea where it says that the, those who followed feared. They feared. Well, I think they feared what they thought was going to be the imminent tumult of the Messiah entering into Jerusalem and the Messianic War. So they feared that. And Jesus, again, he pulls the 12 aside and he tells them what's going to happen. The final phase of his inaugurating the kingdom of God. You see, it is this complex of events of his life, his ministry, his teaching, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and the coming of the Spirit. This complex of events that's viewed as a unit is his inaugurating of the kingdom of God. And he tells them that this final phase of his inaugurating of the kingdom is, isn't going to be what they imagine. So he's trying, he's trying to reorient them and straighten them out. It will not be by glorious conquest. So here comes the Messiah. We're part of his band. He's coming in. God is with him. We're going to have the messianic war. We're going to be victorious. The eternal state is going to be here. And we'll be sitting pretty. And he says, au contraire. You see, it's not going to be like that. It won't be glorious conquest. But it's going to be by suffering humiliation, death, and resurrection. He tells them he's going to be turned over to the Jewish authorities who will condemn him. And they will then turn him over to the Gentiles, to the Romans, who will flog and kill him. But after three days, same as on the third day, he will rise. And if you've seen the movie The Passion, you understand 
something of what's involved in the Roman flogging and crucifixion. Just from a physical side. Ignoring that he's bearing the sins of mankind. Okay? So Jesus is telling them that this is what he's facing. And then we have in 1035 to 45, right after this, we have James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They ask Jesus to do for them whatever they ask. Now, Jesus is way too smart to go for that. Give us a blank check, just whatever we ask. And he says, what do you want? You know, you tell me. You tell me what you want me to do for you. He asked them to specify their request. And they say, and Matthew reports that they say through their mother. She's the agent. But they say they want to sit at his right and left. You see, the two premier positions in his glory. You see, when, when all is done, when we come in and we are triumphant, what we would like is to be at your right and your left. We want the top positions. That's what we're after. We want the top positions. As Daryl Bach says, he notes, they seek, quote, to trump the other disciples and gain rank over them. Now, do you see that the human hunger for status and rank and power and privilege, do you see that that is very stubborn? That's something that's very deep, is I want to get up over you. I want to dominate you. And that's something they want to have position. So much so they're coming to the Lord, trying to angle for it in advance. And it's just amazing after what's been so James and John, they clearly haven't grasped the lesson of chapter 9, verses 33 to 37, where Jesus taught that greatness in the kingdom, it lies not in rank or status, but in making oneself a servant of others, taking this lower role. Being willing to put yourself under people in terms of rank. That's where greatness in the kingdom lies. So he taught them that. He told them that. Moreover, Jesus had just explained that he's going to face suffering, humiliation, and death. And they don't allow that to challenge or affect their understanding of the kingdom of God or the Messiah's role in ushering it in. They proceed as if he didn't say it. He's just said something to them again. Very significant. They proceed as if he didn't say it. As if he's going to triumph without a cross. And they jump to the matter of their position in the kingdom. That's what we want. And Jesus tells them they don't know what they're asking. And he tells them that precisely because they ignore that he will usher in the kingdom through his suffering humiliation, death, and resurrection. You see, the kingdom in which they seek exalted positions will not, in its initial manifestation, in its inaugurated form, it will not subjugate or eliminate opposing forces. Rather, the the inaugurated kingdom, in that kingdom, sin and evil will be allowed to coexist with the kingdom until Jesus returns to consummate the kingdom he inaugurated. So until that time, you're going to be living in the midst of sin and evil and opposition and hostility. And you don't understand that. And so your request for a position, premier status, you are asking in ignorance because you don't know the nature of the kingdom. And so he tells them, you see, you don't know what you're asking. You know, we look at that and say, what do you mean they don't know? They want power. No, I know that. But he's telling them something different. He's saying you don't understand 
the nature of the kingdom. I'm telling you, contrary to how you see it coming in with this great military triumph being led by me, that it's coming in through death, humiliation, resurrection. And you don't let that register. You don't let that adjust. What is the nature of this kingdom then? And so he wants them to see that and he's telling them that. So it's not that way. See, asking to be exalted in that kingdom without being aware of that fact is asking in ignorance. Now that's why Jesus calls them back. See, he calls them back right then to his coming suffering and death by asking, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? See, he wants them to realize that the inaugurated kingdom, that kingdom that is here and present until the consummation at Christ's return, that it will involve rejection, hostility, persecution, suffering, and in some cases even death. He wants them to recognize that. That's the front end. That's the initial state of the kingdom in which they're requesting preeminence. And James and John, they assert that they can drink the cup Jesus drinks and can be baptized with the baptism with which he's baptized, by which they probably mean they're, they're willing to become martyrs in the coming messianic war. That's probably what they're talking about. You recall Peter's declaration of his willingness to die. Matthew 26, 35, and some other places. And Jesus lets them know that they will in their own way, they will in their own way experience his cup and baptism, meaning that they will indeed suffer, and in the case of James, even be killed. So he lets them know that, but it will not be in the, in the glorious messianic war they probably imagine, a war they're looking at as establishing the evil, free, eternal state. That's a misunderstanding. Rather, it will be as participants in the kingdom of God that until the consummation coexists with weeds, with opposing forces. It is only at the consummation that all that is contrary to God's eternal vision will be stripped out. And then the eternal, the, the kingdom of God will be uh, you know, the eternal life. You see, so this is what he's doing here. And then Jesus adds in verse 40, that was the first bell, right? Second bell? Oh, my bad. Uh, next week, Lord willing. I missed that one. Thank you. 